Hello, my name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled, When ADHD Triggers Emotional Outbursts, Scripts for Your Flashpoints. Emotional dysregulation is an almost universally experienced symptom of ADHD for both children and adults. Feelings of frustration, impatience, anger, excitability, you name it. When they hit, they hit hard and fast. And in the heat of the moment, it's hard to put into practice the emotional control strategies we have tried to learn. Today's webinar will give you the tools you need to identify and respond to your emotional triggers. We'll discuss how stress affects the ADHD brain, plus how to develop greater body-based awareness, utilize key language tools, and practice radical self-acceptance. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Sharon Celine. Dr. Celine is a clinical psychologist and author of the award-winning book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, working together to empower kids for success in school and life and also the ADHD Solution Deck. She specializes in working with children, teens, and emerging adults and families living with ADHD, anxiety, learning disabilities, autism, twice exceptionality, and mental health issues. Her unique perspective as a sibling in an ADHD home, combined with decades of experience as a clinical psychologist and educator, clinician, and consultant, assists her in guiding families and adults toward effective communication and closer connections. Dr. Celine lectures and facilitates workshops internationally on topics such as understanding ADHD, executive functioning, anxiety, motivation, different kinds of learners, and the teen brain. She's a regular contributor to attitudemag.com, as well as psychologytoday.com, She's a featured expert on Mass Appeal on WWLP-TV and a part-time lecturer at the Smith School for Social Work. Her writing has been featured in numerous online and print publications, including MSN, the Psychotherapy Networker, Smith College Studies in Social Work, Attention Magazine, Attitude Magazine, Psych Central, and Inquirer.com. You can learn even more at www.drsharonceline.com. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Celine, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may submit questions for Sharon at any time. Just navigate to the text box under the video player. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in an email you will receive about an hour after the live broadcast. We will also have a transcript of today's event that we will make available in the coming week. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, Visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 426 to access the slides, the webinar replay, the certificate of attendance option, and the webinar transcript. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. Subscribe now and you will receive our upcoming winter issue, which features an article written by Dr. Celine on how to deal with difficult family members during holiday gatherings as part of Attitude's Holiday Survival Guide. Very, very on point for today's conversation. <laughs> and finally, the sponsor of today's webinar is Play Attention. Improve executive function and self-regulation for more than 25 years. Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed. Tufts University School of Medicine found Play Attention significantly improved attention, executive function, academic performance, and behavioral control of ADHD students 
Your program will include a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Home and professional programs are available. Call 828-676-2240 or click the link on your screen to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation for free. Visit playattention.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So now we've gotten all of that out of the way. Welcome, Sharon. We are so happy to have you today. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for leading this discussion on emotional triggers on ADHD. Thank you so much, Annie, for that beautiful introduction. I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to shift to the slide so we can get started. Um, we have a lot to share and a lot to uh, talk about, and I want to make sure there are pl there's plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, so I'd like to start off with a little bit of self-compassion. We all lose it at times, um, and we're doing our very best to attend to our fundamental needs um, every day. And we're doing our best to show up for others as well. I'm just fixing my lights a little because the sun came out and it got very bright in my room here. Um, you know, we all have uh, our feelings, a range of feelings. And those feelings are, we often label as good or bad. But what I'd like you to think about instead is that it's just a spectrum of emotion. It's just energy. And how that energy gets transformed is how we tend to respond to it. So living with ADHD means living with a stress producing condition. Um, most people with ADHD struggle in some very fundamental and significant ways in their daily lives. And so it's important not only to learn self-care, self-soothing, uh, but to be able to um, treat ourselves with kindness. Um, we want to reduce fatigue and frustration and burnout. And this means we want to improve our responsiveness to things instead of our reactivity. So we're going to try to build flexible problem solving and creative thinking and foster clearer communication and compassion for ourselves and others. In 2005, the National Science Foundation published an article summarizing research on human thoughts per day. It was found that the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day, and of those thoughts, 80% were negative, and 95% were exactly the same repetitive thoughts as the day before. So I hope when you leave this webinar today, you'll have some skills on how to deal with emotional triggers, but you'll also come away with really considering ways that you can savor the good stuff, how to become aware of the good things in the in our lives, the things that you're doing that you feel proud of, so um, that um, there are there are amazing things that are happening all around us that we often don't notice or take for granted. For example, maybe you're sitting watching this um, webinar with a delicious cup of coffee or um, a, a great, uh, a great um, hot tea. Um, these are little things that will help us counterbalance the 80% of the negative thoughts. Now, Everybody has those moments when a switch flips and suddenly a volcano of angry, negative emotions erupts. Before you know what's happening, you say or do things that surely you will regret later. But you can't stop yourself. It's sort of like you're on this roll, the, the snowball effect. Relationships, school, and work are all affected by this emotional dysregulation. Why does this occur, particularly for people with ADHD, so intensely and often, and what could you do differently? Now, the flip side of emo emotional attention, emotional intensity, 
emotional intensity, something I know well, um, and, um, and outbursts, I have to say, um, is a natural excitement for things, an enthusiasm for things that people like. So instead of just focusing on, oh, I have this problem, I erupt like a volcano, I can't control my emotions, the flip side of that is that you, like me, might be very passionate and enthusiastic and excitable and fun to be around. Um, it's energy and it's how it gets transformed in the course of our daily lives. So today we're gonna to explore how to identify triggers, looking at the, we're gonna look at the biology of activation, how to create strategies in advance for dealing with triggers that include body-based awareness, mindfulness, collaboration, and of course, as I said earlier, self-compassion. We are dealing with habits here, habits of reactivity versus consciously creating new habits of response, responsiveness. Reactivity habits are things like denial, blame, attacking, contempt, catastrophizing, and escalation. Responsive habits uh, include self-awareness about biological signals related to dysregulation. I'm feeling a fluttering in my stomach. I feel a tightness in my chest. Um, choosing a soother instead of an intensifier. I'm actually going to go outside and walk my dog or, or down the block to slow things down instead of calling up some a friend or a family member and complaining and activate, further activating myself for this issue that I'm already triggered by. We're going to take time to settle. We're going to own our part. We're going to work on developing our accountability as, as a way of responding differently when we're upset. Most people who are upset with us, um, that th their emotionality usually is deflated as when we can own and be accountable for how we are acting or what something that we've done that may have been hurtful. We also want to listen and seek ways to make amends and move forward. Please think about this for a second. Every time you deny something that you've done or you blame someone else, you're throwing fuel on the fire of reactivity. You're not actually helping yourself settle down. You're further activating yourself. So let's start our first poll. Um, uh, if you could launch the first poll, that would be great. Um, uh, let's see, um, we have a survey and I believe that Carly is gonna launch that survey for us. Um, I think it's being launched. I don't know um, if someone could let me know in the presenter chat, uh, the poll has been launched. Okay, great. So what do you notice um, that you are, well, what do you notice about yourself when you are on the verge of or in the midst of an emotional outburst? Maybe you get a headache, you start perspiring. Like what are some signs that you notice that you're kind of heading off the edge of the cliff? For me, um, I end up feeling like um, a certain kind of shakiness in my gut and sometimes a, a tightening in my chest. And that lets me know that I'm, I'm really um, kind of headed into the land of overreaction rather than response. Than, than, than sort of uh, responsiveness and slowing down. Um, okay, so I hope that you, many of you have filled out this poll. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Um, really take a minute and think about like what kinds of things set you off? What are some signs that you're, you're on this, the verge of this or when you're in the middle of it? All right, thank you, Carly. If you could close the poll, that would be great. And then post the results. So let's take a few minutes and look at the anger and the ADHD anger connection. So in terms of how human beings function, sensory information goes through the thalamus in our brain, which acts like, you know, the um, kind of the central railway station, and then to the thinking brain or the emotional brain. If a threat is perceived, the amygdala, the part of our brain that's responsible for fight, flight, or freeze, um, takes over and it goes into that mode, you know, um, before what we call the neocortex, the thinking part of our brain, which kind of coats our brain and then really is, is situated here in our prefrontal cortex where our emotion, where our executive functions lie. Um, 
the amygdala, the emotional brain takes over from the thinking brain. So if you think about your car, like a Tesla or a VW bug, <clears throat> The engine is in the back right here in the reptilian brain, and that's you know our heart rate and our blood pressure. In the middle, in the deep, in the middle of the brain is our emotional brain where the amygdala lives, and then coding the sort of the top of the brain all the way right here to the prefrontal cortex is the neocortex, our thinking brain, which really coalesces around age 25 in people uh, without, uh, uh, without ADHD and with up to a three-year delay in people with ADHD. And that means that it, in terms of the connectivity throughout the brain and the pathways running efficiently. When we are in what's called by, uh, uh, you know, um, Daniel Goleman, um, an emotional, an amygdala hijack. Um, there's a release of stress hormones that are set that that are that are set out in the brain and the body. Adrenaline, which is also, is also called norepinephrine, which is also called epinephrine. So we have adrenaline running through our bodies and our brains, epinephrine, and cortisol. It takes six seconds for the amygdala to tell the part of our brain to release the adrenaline and the cortisol. But it can take at least 20 minutes for our body and our brain to recover from the release of those uh, hormones. Now, many threats that we face today are much more symbolic than the physical ones uh, our brains evolved to deal with. You know, there's not too many tigers walking around the jungle where we live. But there are other dangers, um, real dangers for many people that have to do with racism, uh, homophobia, um, financial insecurity, um, socioeconomic issues. Um, and, and there are also threats that we perceive that have more to do with relational issues that aren't a threat to our physical safety, but nonetheless feel like a threat to us as well. Um, research has found that people who have strong working memory um, have very um, effective ways of managing emotions. And people with weaker working memory struggle with the capacity to regulate emotions. And many people who have ADHD struggle with working memory challenges as well as with processing speed issues. Now, when emotions rule the brain and the prefrontal cortex goes offline, what happens is that our weaker working memory can't really pull up from our our longer term memory um, tools or situations or coping strategies that we've used in the past that we could apply to what's happening now. So there's limited verbal and impulse control that occurs and the amygdala can't really distinguish between physical and emotional threats. So any kind of persistent stress in your life, whether it's at work or home or at school, can trigger the amygdala to automatically respond to send out that adrenaline and cortisol to move into fight, flight, or freeze before your frontal lobes can provide any logical reasoning to the situation and get it to calm down so it can drive the car that is you, right? Oops. Okay. Now, if you have ADHD, you may also live with rejection sensitivity dysphoria, which is a common coexisting condition, although it's not a formal diagnostic category. And um, RSD refers to the intense feelings related to the belief that you've let other people down, embarrassed yourself, failed at something or made a serious unfixable mistake. And as a result, people pull back their support, love or respect. RSD causes extreme emotional pain that plagues both children and adults, even when no actual re rejection has taken place. This affects our, our, pro our, our um, reaction and our outburst, or those, those charged thoughts that we have that lead to um, the uh, volcanic eruptions. People with RSD struggle with letting go of past hurts or rejections because they experience heightened emotional sensitivity. They may hold on to unkind words or actions directed at them for months or years. Maybe you just can't shake off a comment a friend made and believe at some level that you deserve it. Um, that happened to me today. My husband told me something that my, a friend of mine told him that was really hurtful. And, you know, I'm having some trouble shaking it off. 
um, you, you, you think maybe you've fallen short and no matter what anyone else says, you, it's hard to bounce back. This difficulty with recovering from personal criticism or rejection contributes to emotional dysregulation. Um, how does the ADHD brain act under stress? And I'd like to uh, just throw out a, a thank you to Dr. Marcy Caldwell, who inspired the stages of emotional intensity that I'm presenting here. When uh, we are flooded, um, when we are in an amygdala hijack, this, the emotional regulation issues of living in a world that is not designed for neurodiverse brains um, are, are, are huge and um, almost seem unsolvable. The lack of filters in the ADHD brain for internal and external stimulation combines with a full on switch when feeling comes into awareness and flooding begins. Limited, your limited coping strategies that are natural uh, to having executive functioning challenges can lead to increased disorganization, emotional disorganization, thought disorganization, and dysregulation. So what we want to look for in terms of how we are erupting and what's causing the eruptions are patterns more than content. Content will continue to change. It's our pattern of responding that we want to look at and shift. So there are different stages in our emotional life where our, our baseline, for example, is what I call in the flow. We're calm, we're comfortable, we have control of our thinking and attention, we're present. Level one, we're sensing a disturbance in the field somewhere. There's a feeling, an uncomfortable feeling that's mildly present, but we can ignore it. Level two, um, <clears throat> activation. So this is when the alert system is activated. You're feeling uncomfortable. It's harder to ignore it. It's harder to disengage. You're starting to feel overwhelmed. Maybe you're ruminating over something. And then level four, level three, which is high alert. This is total focus on your feeling or the reason for it. It's impossible to ignore. You want it to stop, but you feel like you can exert very little control over it. Physical symptoms may be present. You are in the middle of a tidal wave of emotion. So how can we improve self-regulation? Well, one of the keys to improving self-regulation is building metacognition. Now, metacognition is the last executive functioning skill to coalesce around age 25 in neurotypical brains and with a three-year delay in um, people with ADHD. It's a metacogn metacognitive thinking is a powerful tool which allows you to acknowledge problems without succumbing to them and particularly to a failure mentality or I'm wrong or giving up. It's a way to focus on continued learning, improving efficiency in problem solving, and identifying tools and resources that you can use for support in a given moment. This process is directly related to self-awareness because it governs behavioral output and it's tied to emotional control. Researchers at the University College of London have found that subjects with stronger metacognition actually have more gray matter in the anterior right prefrontal cortex, an area of the brain that's found to be smaller in people with ADHD. So folks with ADHD, you may require a bit more time and effort to strengthen your metacognitive skills. That's fine. Let's not judge ourselves for it. Let's just put, um, you know, put in, put the elbow, put some elbow grease in, and 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 really apply ourselves. The ability for self-regulation and assessment allows you to be the person you want to be, to see what's worked well, to be able to apply what's worked well, and and feel feel um, feel like you're um, learning while you're living. Um, one of the things that can help us, particularly around anger and frustration with metacognition, is to notice where am I feeling the shift? What's happening? What are the body sensations that are giving me clues that I'm becoming activated? And what can I do to slow those down? 
So we want to use open-ended questions and reframe answers from good and bad to what's working and what's not working. Instead of asking yourself, why can't I do this differently? We want you to, I want you to ask yourself, how could I do this differently? And what support do I need to make this happen? Now, in order to manage those disruptions that we experience, we have to prepare for them. So this means that accepting that we will lose it at times. We will be triggered, we will be activated. That's part of being human. So often, um, our, your, uh, the overtaxed executive functioning skills of people who live with ADHD can't cope with effectively managing and responding to this rush of, rush of emotions. What you experience is overwhelm, sometimes excitement or passion, which can be seen as positive feelings, but more often, worry, anger, disappointment, uh, frustration, which are seen as negative ones. Emotions create action. They get things started and keep them going. When anybody is flooded by feelings, they struggle to access those parts of themselves that know what good choices are, what effective choices are. The big emotions push aside any sensible information about how to deal appropriately with what's happening right now. So how do we access our wiser, more modulated self? How do we access that part of ourself that knows what to do in a calm, steady way? Because what's happened in the rush of an emotional outburst is that the part of you that feels injured, that feels blamed, that doesn't like yourself, that feels that you never can get things right, actually puffs up and takes over. So the first thing that we wanna do is we want to slow things down by addressing the physical signals you're experiencing, those red flags of dysregulation. And this would include using different breathing techniques. Um, I would recommend al alternate nostril breathing, uh, which is a yoga technique. I also like to use what I call triangle breathing. You breathe in for four. We can all do it now. Breathe in for four, hold for four, and exhale slowly for six, pause for two at empty, and do it again. So whether you're doing alternate nostril breathing or, and I suggest doing rounds of three or some breathing technique that works for you, maybe belly breathing. It's important that you slow yourself down by accessing by accessing the breathing that you have. This helps slow down the amygdala hijack. You might want to change your location, step outside, go to a different room, go into the bathroom and wash your hands. This is one of my personal favorites. And look at my, I, I take a look at myself in the mirror and I say, okay, this is a moment. It's not your best moment. It's not the most fun moment, but it's a moment you'll get through it. You've had other moments before. So something that you can say to yourself that's reassuring and encouraging. Uh, you might wanna engage in a physical activity when you're triggered. Take a walk, go for a run, do some yoga. Um, uh, perhaps uh, decide you wanna listen to music or you know, do some coloring or do, the, um, do some Sudoku or, or the Wordle on your phone. You have to set a timer for the phone things because, you know, you'll just plop into them. Um, and whatever they are, you, you really want to have a sense of what these soothers, are, these soothers can be for you. Write them down. Put them on a note in your phone or on a Post-it. Put them on a couple of different places. Make sure you also consider halt. Hungry. Oh, my God. Um, I'm having a mental moment hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. So um, HALT is a way for us to be able to uh, identify, am I hungry? No, I just had lunch. Am I angry? Yes, I'm very angry. Am I I'm feeling lonely or at a loss about what to do? Yes. What are my options? I'm going to go to my list on my phone. Am I tired? Is that making me feel more, you know, sort of susceptible to stress or vulnerable and vulnerable to reactivity? Yes. Okay, so we wanna sort of just go through those quickly. 
What are some interventions for regulating the stages of emotional intensity? So the best interventions for emotional control depend on where you are in the stages I talked about in a previous slide. So difficult feelings follow patterns. So you wanna you know, identify the patterns to increase mastery. So when you're on high alert, when you're most dysregulated, um, the body is, is, is fully engaged to fight or flee. Your muscles are tense, your breathing is shallow to get more oxygen to your blood, your digestion slows down, which is why you may feel nauseous or have diarrhea, your heart is racing to send blood to your muscles, your blood flow is away from the prefrontal cortex in your brain to the amygdala to make sure that it's able to keep you safe. Maybe you're perspiring to cool down your body because it's heating up. This is why a physical response is called for when you get into this category of high alert. Change your situation. Try some of the things I talked about in terms of breathing or activity, getting a glass of water, uh, whatever it can help you open up and breathe. Because when you're in high alert, you're jet most people stop breathing. The breath is held tight. So we wanna inhale and have longer exhales with that pause on empty to help us slow things down. In the activation level, we want to, to get out of wherever we are, uh, but we shouldn't. So we are sort of fighting our emotions in a way that's like swimming upstream. So there's, we're engaged in you know, this sort of battle between emotionality and thinking. Um, so we want to engage the language centers of the brain at this point to be able to turn down the emotional centers. And this is where that part of us, that wise part of us, really needs to step up and talk to that, you know, very reactive, you know, perhaps hysterical, perhaps just, you know, angry beyond any shadow of a doubt part to be able to, to, to have some phrases that you can say to yourself, like, yes, you're feeling upset right now. It's okay to be angry, you need, but, we, but it's okay to be angry and what are the things we can do to settle down? Personally, when I'm upset and someone says you need to calm down, um, the steam starts going out of my ears. Um, it just is infuriating for me. I don't wanna be told to calm down. You probably don't wanna be told either. So what we wanna do in those moments is to think about slowing down or settling down, which to me is kind of like a rock that you throw into a pond and it sinks to the bottom of the pond or the lake and it's solid and steady. That's where we wanna get back to, to get to that green in the flow stage. Um, when you're in the disturbance in the field stage, you, this is also a time to talk back to that negative voice in your head because you have more wherewithal to, di to distinguish and differentiate between your emotions and emotional, emotional influence thinking. Um, you want to shift your focus more to your experienced, rational prefrontal cortex, that wise inner self. Think of someone who loves you in, in this moment. If you need some help on what you're going to say to yourself, close your eyes or when the workshop is done, I want you to think of someone who really has loved you in your life. Maybe it's a grandparent, maybe it's a parent, a partner, a friend, a pet. What would they say to you? if you were um, hurting? What would you say to a nine-year-old with a skin knee? This is not usually what we say to ourselves when we're um, upset or after we've exploded. We have a whole lot of other things that that negative part says that are usually very unkind and critical. What would that part of you um, the part that's inside of you, that wise self that's been fed by the love of this person actually say that's comforting. How can you compare um, the limiting beliefs that you have about a situation or about yourself to the real facts on the ground? So in order to manage our upsets, we wanna replace old habits with effective routines. So we need a strategy of preferred responses. And when we have these preferred responses, over time, they will become more of a, a habit, which is an acquired pattern of behavior that's repeated until it becomes almost involuntary. Uh, these habits um, often develop to, to help us lower stress or meet an emotional need. Um, so we can have habits that are really useful and we can have habits that are not super useful. Those that, um, that um, kind of, um, 
you know, kind of throw throw logs on the fire um, that active keep us activated and distressed. Um, so changing a habit means targeting one of the three um, at com habit components, um, which would be, um, uh, you know, basically the trigger um, and um, the uh, the the um, the response and then the reward. Um, so we are we basically have a trigger. We choose an alternative behavior to re, to address the, the the discomfort relating from that trigger, and then we respond uh, with a way that is that actually is beneficial to us rather than something different. Um, so um, practicing self awareness in combination with self evaluation can really help us change our habits, um, which is the only thing that we can um, really control in these situations, which is a choice that we make about uh, our behavior and how we respond. So instead of letting shame or regret bring you down, we want to create a habit that actually will help us feel good about who we are and what we're doing. So how are we gonna change our relationship to intense feelings? We want to break the link between the reactive part of yourself and how you define yourself. Those two parts that I described. You are not your ADHD reactivity. Instead, what we want to do is investigate your reactivity like your Sherlock Holmes. Become curious about how it works, when it shows up, and look for patterns. Expect that you're going to get angry and lose it sometimes. Um, because there's a part of you that says blah, 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 and you're wrong or blah, 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 and you can't handle it. So anger is really a magnification of a habitual response to uncomfortable feelings and an underestimation of alternative resources to deal with it. So how are we going to, you know, address the rejection sensitivity dysphoria that's so often a part of our, of, of our explosive, um, intense emotions. So one helpful tip is to nurture your strengths and, your, and, and focus as much as possible on what you love to do and what you do well. So we're gonna pay attention to your positive efforts every day, maybe on your phone or, phone or uh, have a journal and write down three things that went well during the day. And they can be small things like I had a great cup of coffee, or I really liked uh, the clothes I wore to work, or I kicked that presentation um, off to a great start and I followed through with a strong ending. So something that you feel good about. Um, before you respond to someone who said something that's mean or hurtful, pause and say, that's interesting, or um, let me think about it, I'll get back to you. You need time for your body to settle. Remember the six seconds and the 20 minutes? You need that 20 minutes. So take the time you need to regroup and then come back, circle back. Um, uh, you might get into an over-focus loop on something someone said or did that really feels so unfair to you. Um, you may also get into an over-focus loop about how you have responded to something that was um, unkind or um, you're ashamed of what you did, and then you're in a shame spiral. You can't forgive yourself for your role about what happened. So we want to start from the perspective that we're all going to make mistakes, and that's okay. We don't have to take things personally. What we need to do is to develop some statements of affirmation that will assist us in reducing the noise of that negative part of ourselves. So um, self-talk will guide you. And some ideas for phrases like this are, I'm stronger than I think. My mind is uniquely wired and creative. I can make a mistake and be a good person. I can be hurt and bounce back. Now, one of the things that's really important when there is a disagreement, when you have an issue with another person, is how you're going to handle it. Um, and um, yes, you may say or do something you regret, but really what we have to do is if you're in a relationship, whether it's with a partner or even a colleague or someone at work, you have to have a plan for what you're going to do when you disagree. 
And the, the, the tool that I have found to be the most helpful is reflective listening. Um, and particularly in relationships um, where, um, uh, you know, John, Dr. John Gottman says that the uh, positive to negative ratio should be five positives for every negative. That's not what most people in relationships experience. Using reflective listening can assist you in really feeling heard and getting to say what you need to say. I encourage you to practice this exercise three times a week because when you have the tools and the, um, the uh, habits of this practice down, then you can use it in the middle of an upset, which is when it's most effective. So I've uh, put the uh, tools up here. Um, you agree on an amount of time, one person speaks and the other person who is, do is doing the hard work of listening and not reacting, repeating back what they hear, um, raising your hand like this to indicate that you need the other person to pause so you can actually repeat back what you've said because it's really hard to do. Um, and when you repeat back, you want it to be as close as possible. So you say, um, what I heard you say is this, did I get that right? And the person will say yes, and then go back to talking, or the person will say no, what I said was blah, blah, blah. Then you repeat that again. And when the timer goes off, then you switch. The other person becomes the speaker, and the first person becomes the listener doing the same thing. And at the end of the time session, and I encourage you to start off small with 10 minutes, maybe, and then grow, I mean, maybe if you can, grow, 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 to um, 15 or 20, um, the conversation is over. You're not gonna refer back to it until the next session. Because if you start to unpack whatever was said in the reflective listening sessioning, session, I can guarantee you're gonna get into another argument. So um, this is a very helpful tool. A lot of people don't want to do the practicing because it seems boring, but it's also a nice way to connect with your partner uh, about what happened in your day. You don't have to be talking about some deep emotional pain or uh, trouble. You can talk about your day and just have them reflect that back. It's the tool of reflective listening that we're interested in. I also want to introduce, and for those of you who know my work, um, my uh, STAR method, um, which goes along with my five C's of living fully with ADHD, um, self-control, compassion, collaboration, consistency, and celebration. The goal, you know, as I said, is to slow things down. So you want to decide in advance of a conflict how you're going to handle the conflict. So this means how are you going to call for a time apart, a stop in the action, what activities can be done during that time to help people settle, and to set a time limit for that. And this is an activity that you can do in a relationship, but really also in a family. It's very helpful in a family. And I talk about it in my book, I call it Stop, Think, Act. But I realized since I wrote my book that I left out recover and recover is such an important part of that. So you're gonna call um, a stop in the action and use body, bodily signals that you're becoming dysregulated, um, you know, access your soothers. Um, one child I worked with used to go under her bed with a flashlight and read for 20 minutes. One adult I worked with would get down, would go on their exercise bike for 20 minutes. Um, someone else I worked with liked to um, just uh, do a crossword puzzle. So whatever is something that's soothing for you. Um, um, you want to talk up, then you want to come back together. So you've called the stop, then it's a think. And the think is when you come back together and you talk and review and listen and brainstorm about what has, about what's happened, but all brainstorm, excuse me, about what you're going to do next. So this is a time when you use statements such as, I hear, I noticed, tell me more, I'm listening. Or you can use your reflective listening technique right here. Um, but this is when you kind of review, you generally review what was going on, you're listening, you're not correcting, you're not justifying, you're not explaining, you're just hearing and validating. And then you want to rely on a request um, to, to, to uh, on what I call a connecting request that's part of the brainstorm. What can we do differently what can we do now that's the next right thing for us to move towards? How can we move on from this? What needs to happen? And then you do that. 
right? That's the act. You just, you talk about it in the think phase and in the act phase, you do the thing that you mutually decided on is the next step. Then you give yourself some time and space to recover. You're delaying any teaching. Your goal is not to teach anything in this moment. Your goal is to let people absorb what happened, think about it themselves, and then maybe in several hours or the next day, if there's a teaching, particularly for those of you who are parents with kids that you want to, to, to bring up, then, um, then think about um, how you can do that in a way that doesn't you know, reactivate the entire experience. It's most useful to have a once a week family meeting um, to talk about how you're gonna deal with upsets in the family and even in the relationship um, so that you have a strategy that you can apply when it occurs. So let's do our second poll. If you could please launch the poll, that would be great. And what are some potential obstacles you might find for using the STAR method or reflective listening? What do you think would get in the way for you to actually try some of these tools to help you manage your anger um, more effectively? I think one of the hardest things for many people with ADHD is that there are so that or people without ADHD when they're really upset, anybody is that they're so dysregulated that it's difficult to participate in anything because you just want to like get the anger out. And um, that actually often results in greater anger and more upset. So instead, we want to be able to use that STAR method to use the reflective listening technique so that you're leaning into a format to create a habit of a routine of how to deal with a, a situation that's gone off the rails. This is the kind of script you want. I, I mean, it, the script that we're talking about here is not something that I'm gonna feed you that is an one thing that works for everybody because it just doesn't happen. You are you and this person over here is them and I'm me and we all are different. So we want to be able to create our own scripts that make sense for us. Um, thank you. If you could uh, stop the poll and show the results, that would be great. So let's talk a little bit in this idea of applying, you know, tools to you. What are some conversational tools that foster connection and accountability? So as I mentioned earlier, Dr. John Goffman, Gottman, excuse me, um, who's done so much research on couples, he's identified what he calls four horsemen of the apocalypse in relationships. And though that these four horsemen are identified as criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Do you do any of these when you're, uh, when you're angry or upset? Ideally, we wanna keep these out of our conversations. So um, we want to own our own experience. One thing that really you know, continues um, and, per and perpetuates anger in any situation is denial of anything that you've done. Like you are a victim and this person is all at fault. And you know, things are always 50-50. Um, in fact, my dad always says there's three sides to every issue, yours, mine, and the truth. Um, and I, 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 I kind of like that because there, the truth is a perspective that we can't really get to because nobody has that kind of obje objectivity, but we do have these other sides. So we want to own our own experience and be accountable, even if we're super ashamed of it, and even if we're not sure we agree about it. So um, really try hard not to take what the other person is saying so personally, Park your activated part in a nearby garage and stick with listening and reflecting. Say, I feel blank when I see you blank because I need or want to blank. I feel frustrated when I see you tap your pencil and hear the taps um, because I need to focus while I'm on my computer and, um, and your tapping is distracting me. 
So what are some strategies to deal with high conflict situations? We know that disrespectful behavior is a signal. What is your child showing you with this? You know, pushback and oppositional behavior may mask other emotions such as anxiety or depression, and that kids act out when they're bored or angry or frustrated. Expect this. Um, uh, and, and sometimes kids need to refuse. What, where are areas in your child's life where, you're, where your child can have the freedom to say no? Ask yourself, why am I talking now? Help your kids learn to ask themselves, why am I talking now? And consider offering a system of take back of the day. Everyone gets one free pass. They've said something that they regret and they get to take it back. Uh, a few other tips for scripts would include curious inquiry, wondering about, instead of making an, an assumption about, um, uh, active and reflective listening, using open versus closed questions, who, what, when, how, where versus why, um, uh, focusing on collaborating rather than, you know, basically uh, telling people how it should go. Um, even for children, you can call pause in the action, you call that stop, but you don't necessarily have to dictate what's going to happen uh, in terms of the result of, of, your, of your stop. Um, offer limited choices, so particularly with kids, so they feel like they have some autonomy. And reframe things. Change things from you can't into I'm not sure if or that doesn't work. And help with building the, dis the, the disappointment muscle, tolerating discomfort. It's okay for any of these new things that we're talking about today to feel strange. It's not what you usually do. That's okay. You're trying something differently. And uh, what I would like to do is, is actually say something about apologies. So apologies um, can be meaningless if you continue to do the same thing over and over again. So it makes sense that people with ADHD are not only reluctant to be wrong again and to apologize, um, but they're also very accustomed to having committed another mistake and they sort of blow it off. And they really want to, often people want to say a quick, I'm sorry and get over it. So when, I'm, uh, when, when this is what's happening or eye contact is difficult or a thoughtful apology um, really is not to be had, think about apologies of action how you can make amends because they integrate words with doing. And it can be a collaborative process that's a combination of a verbal apology and doing something that actually helps the other person. This integrates accountability with recognition of a mistake that we made and acknowledgement that we as humans are going to grow and learn. Uh, finally, um, I want to encourage you to focus on resilience as part of a coping mechanism for dealing with those triggers. Um, resilience is the antidote for shame and, and uh, which uh, underlines so much of our response to hurt or disappointment or fear. Um, we wanna learn how to bounce back when problems arise and not blame others or ourselves. We wanna ask what could happen differently here? And these skills lead to fostering a growth mindset, a mentality that taking risks and doing something different, responding differently is okay, even if you're embarrassed about it not working out or you're worried about what's gonna happen. You're gonna try it, you're gonna see what happens, you're gonna regroup, maybe try something else, or if it worked out, do it again. Focus on one thing that you'd like to change, okay? Because the learning process happens over time. It's not something that you're gonna do once and that worked, so that's it, it's over. You've gotta practice, reset, and practice some more. Well, thank you so much for joining me today for this webinar. I have a free handout, a gift for those of you who've attended, uh, which is a summary of what I've talked about today. You can um, uh, scan the QR code or we'll put the link um, in the notes for this session. And we have time for some questions. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your question. Thank you for joining me. Sharon, thank you so much for that presentation. A number of people have asked um, if they can access the slides to reference and share with others. Yes, absolutely. 
uh, you can download the slides at any time and you will also receive a link to them in the follow-up email. So before we start Q&A, a quick thank you again to Play Attention for sponsoring this webinar. And the first question I wanted to get to, we have a number of loved ones, spouses and otherwise listening today who are wondering, they understand that saying you need to calm down, you're overreacting is not helpful in the moment. <laughs> They're wondering what can they do in the midst of a, uh, a trigger to not worsen the situation, but to lessen the likelihood that it will happen again or the intensity of another one. So you know, big picture, this is not a great way to live. In the moment, they understand so they need to uh, take, a, take a breath. Yes, this is a great question. And thank you for everyone who's asking this question. So as I talked about in the, in the presentation, we have to plan in advance for moments when the dysregulation occurs. If you don't plan in advance for some of these moments, then in, then whatever you come up with is not going to, to be effective because there's no agreement about it. So this is why I think it's really important to really practice that STAR method. We're going to call a pause in the action. We're going to take a stop and let's regroup in an hour. I'll see. And we'll, we'll talk about what's going on then. Or we're going to take a stop and I'll see you in 25 minutes. We both need to cool off a bit. So include yourself in the conversation. I need to cool off and I, we both need to cool off rather than you're so out of control, you better go calm down. That is not going to work. So we want to look at this because you're with, this is a partner you love. And if they had an, if they had a choice, if they had the, if they had the option of choosing a different way of behaving, believe you me, they would. You know, I'm someone who struggles, who has struggled with emotional intensity and control at different points of my life. And I am so, so clear that I wish I had made different choices. It even brings tears to my eyes when I think about it sometimes. But this is what I, this was my genetic loading. You know, what can I do about it? So what I try to do is to follow my own advice. I say, I need to take a pause and I stop and I go away and I do it, uh, something else until I have, I'm able to come back to the situation and have a conversation about it. And sometimes my husband will say, we need to take a pause. Like, you know, I'll, I can say to him, wow, things are really heating up. We need to take a stop. He can say to me, uh, I'm, I, we, I don't like where this is going. We need to take a stop. Um, and then we agree we're going to stop for a certain amount of time and we come back. And we can, when we come back, we do that reflective listening for 10 minutes or 15 minutes because that's what we have found works for us. He says what he needs to say. I listen and the reverse. So that we want to have tools or you can do the traditional star, which is you take the stop, you come back and think, you talk about, um, you know, what, what, where things got off the rails and what's the next right thing you can do. Then you move into the action of that next right thing. And then you give yourselves time to recover. So either of those are ways that you can do that. But I think it's important to name that the situation is spiraling and the situation needs a pause rather than a particular person. Okay, thank you. And this raises another question that came up quite often, and that is, life is tricky with teenagers. A number <laughs> of parents of adolescents here who say, you know, their suggestion that perhaps their child needs to take a, a pause or they both need to take a pause is met with absolute, you know, hell on earth. Um, right. <laughs> for those right. who, whether it's your child or perhaps your spouse who um, reacts quite negatively to the idea that maybe they are getting triggered. Can you offer any advice in those situations? In these situations, what I like to do is actually put it on my, what I think you should do as a parent is put it on yourself. I actually feel like I am, am getting too revved up here. I need to take a little break. I'm happy to talk about this with you. I'll set your timer. I'll come back in 15 minutes. So you kind of say you need it for yourself. And your teenager will roll your eye, may, may roll their eyes or, you know, tell you something unkind um, or say, you know, I don't have 15 minutes. I need to know about this right now. We need to decide right now. And you can say, actually, I'm sorry, I cannot. I need 15 minutes. And 
just draw the line. And then again, in a calm moment to revisit the pattern of this kind of conversation and re and reaffirm that you will, uh, either of you can call, can say, I need to take a little, uh, I need to take a break because I'm, I, I don't, I can't think straight right now. And I want to think straight and give you a good answer. So that's another way that you can do it. Um, perhaps we will come back and, and do um, a session on when teens trigger emotional help <laughs> first. Yes, I think we might need a series. Like, <laughs> I mean, maybe we'll do a series. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love that. That would be really great. Um, and I will say, we unfortunately, we are out of time. There were um, more than 340 questions submitted Oh my today. goodness. So I think that um, a follow-up would be, would be much appreciated by the Attitude audience. Um, this is very clearly a point of pain, and you have provided some wonderful strategies for us today, Sharon. Thank you so much um, for giving our audience these ways forward. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today as well. We appreciate you coming. And we wanted to point out, we do have, of course, webinars weekly. We have a special event happening next Wednesday, and that is a webinar for ADHD Awareness Month. And it's about how ADHD impacts every aspect of our lives not just our attention, not just our focus. That's with Linda Rogley um, and it's next Wednesday. So we hope you can join us for that. Um, and we hope you sign up at attitudemag.com slash newsletters to get all the alerts you need about upcoming events. So once again, Sharon, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. Thank so you so much, you. Annie. And, and let's talk about doing a follow-up uh, after the new year. Wonderful. Thanks everyone. Bye.